I'd like to introduce someone called Jamie. So this is Jamie. He's 27. He lives with his parents, and he doesn't have any plans to get on the housing ladder anytime soon. Jamie, when he goes on holiday, he, he tends to stay in trendy Airbnbs over your traditional hotel chain. He's done several Udemy courses, sponsored by Google, and now he works at a tech startup running a team of coders. Jamie loves his job because he feels he's connecting people. When he goes out with his friends, he goes to coffee shops and bars where he has Instagram-worthy drinks and he loves to share those moments on social media. Jamie's about having experiences and being a part of something. He knows he should be uh, investing his money, but he would only want to back a company that he feels is socially and environmentally responsible and that could be trusted to do the right things for the world and for investors like him. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I want to illustrate how attitudes have changed since I was younger. My generation were prepared to go to formal university courses in order to work for big corporations and buy a house and a car for our partners, our 2.4 children, and our dog. Nowadays, in the sharing economy, people like Jamie share their cars, their houses, and sometimes even their dogs. <laughs> Jamie's a fictional character, yes, but his profile is true of most people of his generation in terms of the way that they think about work, money, and free time. So what has this got to do with tokenization? A lot has been made of tokenizing equities, bonds, and real estate, and even paintings. But at DigiNex, our capital markets team believe that the success of tokenization will hinge on the blockchain industry's ability to be able to create financial products that are aligned with this new generation's viewpoint. So, products which are easy and cost efficient to access, reduce or eliminate the need for intermediaries, offer investors the chance to be a part of something, and ideally be operated from an app on their iPhone. So what do we mean by tokenization? Tokenization is the process of converting existing assets or future cash flows into tradable digital securities using blockchain technology. Over the past three years, tokenization was thrust into the limelight by a new uh, funding mechanism called the Initial Coin Offering, or ICO. More than 3,500 ICOs were launched since January 2017, raising between 15 and $20 billion globally. Despite a few serious projects and successes, ICOs have generally been misused by issuers. Most ICOs had very little commercial rationale, they lacked transparency, and didn't have appropriate disclosures, and obviously led to a lot of investor losses. But it's important not to lose sight of the fact that the hype around this market did lead to a wave, a new wave of adoption and learning. ICOs took the first step towards democratizing the VC model, nor normally only open to high net worth individuals and institutions. But obviously this first foray into VC burnt a significant amount of these new investors. How do we transition then from a world of mistrust created by an ICO bubble to one in which there are long-term growth prospects and one that can cater to the needs and desires of investors. We believe that this transition must be led by regulators partnering with companies like ours that understand regulatory compliance. And we are starting to see the tide shifting in this direction. Regulators across the globe are responding to these challenges and progressively issuing guidelines for token investments. They seem aligned in the opinion that token investments can fall under existing securities and financial markets regulations and agree that consumer protection and anti-money laundering laws 
should also apply to digital assets. The response from regulators is bringing clarity for market players and paving the way for the participation of institutional investors, which in turn leads to the validation and further adoption of this asset class. The new wave of digital tokens offers investors greater transparency, risk disclosures, and protections aligned with securities legislation. So what's next for this market? The next two years is likely to see significant growth in STOs, driven by the demand of a global sharing economy formed by people like Jamie. I'm very sorry about having to read from a speech. In a society led by millennials, people can enjoy a week on, weekend on the beach without the need to own a beach house. They can get to work without the need to own a bike, a car, or a scooter. And they can invest in a company without the need to, in, to own shares. Security tokens issued on blockchain networks will meet the new investment demands that equity and debt securities cannot serve. There are many ways to structure this new asset class, but one way would be for the owner of a company to retain 100% of the equity ownership and voting rights and distribute a percentage of their sales revenues to token investors via smart contract. Let me give you an example. Jamie just received his variable pay. He's now taking some time off to go and visit the Amazon rainforest with his partner and he's considering how to invest the rest of his money. Jamie would like to invest in something he believes in, and as importantly, something that can generate a good return on his money. He'd love to invest in companies that he uses and interacts with every day, like Uber or Slack. But as we know, those companies are in the hands of a small group of private equity investors. He was considering investing in Tencent Music on the New York Stock Exchange, but he questions whether he's going to get dividends and whether or not his interests are aligned with those as management, as a, as a minority shareholder. Whilst he was in Latin America, Jamie's listed his partner's flat on Airbnb and convinced his friends traveling with him to do the same. He would love to invest in a company like Airbnb. He feels part of this community. So as you can see, Jamie and his friends are stuck between two worlds, a modern dynamic world where he and his friends live and another world that's only served by financial, old financial instruments and services that don't cater to the sharing economy. So what if Jamie could invest in a new security issued by Airbnb, which pays a percentage of all sales that Airbnb earn specifically in Jamie's neighborhood? Instead of equity dividends paid at the discretion of company management and dependent on intermediaries like brokers or banks, Airbnb could pay Jamie through a smart contract, say one dollar for every rental in his neighborhood. Suddenly, Jamie and his friends would have an investment product that they collectively can impact through communal behavior. At DigiNex, we believe this is the way to engage this new generation of investors. <clears throat> so, Security tokens will transform the way people like Jamie invest their money. This is an enabling technology which allows us to do things that weren't possible before. It democratizes access to investment opportunities and allows financial products to be customized and tailored to the new demands of a community-driven society. This technology will also transform the capital structure of companies. Companies that issue tokens will have equity, debt, and security tokens on their balance sheet. There are still a few hurdles ahead. Regulations still need clarification and harmonization globally. Technology is still evolving and there are issues regarding scalability and compatibility among the existing protocols. Will there be a winner between these protocols? Does there even need to be a winner? Or could they all coexist for different uses with cross-chain functionality? Another challenge relates to the underlying infrastructure and ecosystem for security tokens. 
there are still questions, for instance, on the appropriate custody and cybersecurity frameworks for this new asset class. Some regulatory and infrastructure changes are already taking place. Regulators in the Philippines, Switzerland, and Abu Dhabi have implemented or are implementing new regulatory architectures that combine traditional security licenses with this new asset class across origination, distribution, trading, custody, and exchange. The SEC recently forced registration of two previous ICO tokens that were considered securities. This is really important, as it provides a route to regulatory compliance for companies which issued tokens in the past and are now seeking to comply with federal securities laws. At Diginex, we're focused on providing financial solutions with regulatory focus for global impact. And we're starting to see the beginnings of new infrastructure where market participants increasingly focus on regulatory compliance. Topics such as KYC, consumer protection, risk disclosures are becoming a regular part of our day-to-day -day discussions with other market participants. So today, I would urge all of you to leave here and be open to the idea that millennials, like Jamie, might be onto something. That life experiences and being part of something can be more appealing than owning something. So when our marketing team proposed that uh, we leave you a gift today, we said no. And uh, you'll find the card in front of you on your tables um, with a QR code on it. When you scan it, you'll be giving some money to the Mekong Club. Um, the Mekong Club is an NGO that we've been working with, and I'm pleased to announce that our EMIN platform for the Mekong Club is going live in the next month uh, with their first pilot in Thailand. Uh, we have a num number of other pilots going live in different countries. And this, this is to try and help improve the lives of migrant workers across supply chains. We've got Jessica Camus and Mark Blick from our government solutions team at the back. We'd be very happy to talk to you about everything that we're doing in that space. Um, so I'll leave it there and open to any questions that anyone might have. Hi. We, we hear so much about the Millennium, uh, where they're going, what they're doing, and I think it, it is very, very interesting. My question is, what is the buying power of the Millennium Group compared to the rest of the current market? And if Millenniums are looking for a better lifestyle, where are they going to be on the earning potential? Meaning, if the baby boomers were all about trying to make money and that earning power and that buying power, that block, how do they compare? And following what you just described here, I think is great. I think you should also look at waking up the baby boomers to follow that lead so you can be capturing a bigger market. Do you see any comparison there? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously there's a number of questions there. Um, but. Uh, I, I think in terms of thinking about demographics, the, the, the sort of the millennial generation covers actually quite a broad uh, age group. And you know, not, not everyone is like Jamie that, that, that doesn't want to be working full time. And you know, these people do have access to a lot of capital. Um, and I think the biggest challenge of, of you know, asset managers and people collecting capital generally is, is catering to this, this group. Um, I think to your point, you know, getting baby boomers excited about, I'm very excited about it. As a, as a previous banker, you know, what we can do with the way that we restyle these, these products, I think, um, I think it's extremely exciting, the possibilities of really carving out, um, you know, particular revenue streams and then aligning that with some of the benefits that did come from that ICO boom that we saw in 2017, adding utility to revenue streams. You know, let's say you know, he does get this Airbnb token, the next thing is that Airbnb could add utility to holders of that token. So he's getting discounts when he's in Brazil using that token to pay um, for, for his stay, for example. So I think there's, there's huge possibilities with this. I, I, I do get a little bit frustrated, and that's what we tried to highlight with this speech, when people just talk about tokenizing stuff that you know, it doesn't need to be tokenized. I mean, it can help, arguably, to make it more liquid, potentially. Um, but as I, I sat in a meeting with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange um, very recently, and the, the guy that's leading innovation there, even though that they're working on a blockchain solution, 
He's quite skeptical. He said, just because you tokenize this table is not going to make it any more liquid. And it's true. Absolutely. So I think the narrative around security tokens is a little bit frustrating um, when the opportunity is so huge. So hopefully that answered a couple of the questions. Henri. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Henry Wesley, and I run PwC's uh, crypto practice. Thanks for the presentation, Richard. What's your view on the traditional banks entering the space? Because it's a regulated industry. They could do a lot of the same thing. Do you see them as a competitor coming in or uh, more as partners to what you're doing here? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, we definitely do see in this area of our business the banks as a, as a key competitor. Um, but when we actually started launching this business and thinking about the business plan, we actually the first person that we ended up hiring was a guy from Deutsche Bank who'd been pitching it within Deutsche Bank for two years. He was so frustrated with just the lack of movement on that, on that uh, subject that he just said, okay, I've just got to leave. And uh, I think the point is that, you know, as we see often with innovation, is startups need to lead it. And then you have the big behemoths that come, or the incumbents that come later. So we definitely do see that two, three years down the line, we're going to be competing with Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. But you know, the, the, it'll be likely that they'll be looking to partner with people like us or acquire parts of our business. You know, hopefully we'll be resistant to that, but um, it's always difficult. But I imagine that there'll be a time where, you know, I used to work at Nomura, where Nomura wants to, you know, explore this space in Japan. You've got JP Morgan in the US, you might have Deutsche Bank in Europe, and they're looking for a credible partner that's there's always had a very white hat approach to this space. So we see them really as partners, at least for the next two to three years. Good question though, thank you. Hey, thanks for the presentation. It's Anthony from Oracle Partners in Hong Kong. Um, speaking on the uh, topic of STOs, you know, obviously there's a lot of talks, a lot of hype, you know, for the past like few months after the ICO bust. Um, I just wanna like, you know, uh, hear your, your thoughts and opinions on how fast do you see the STOs actually come to life? As you know, there are a lot of regulatory like you know hurdles and concerns, mm -hmm. and obviously you know from our side we see a lot of people with supplies you know to tokenize mm -hmm. assets. But um, where like do you see the demand out there, and like you know how how early do you see like actually you know, say you know developing countries like Switzerland, Hong Kong, New York, you know US or wherever like you know mm -hmm. having an SEO platform that's ready to list these SEO projects. Thanks. Yeah, look, great question. Um, I think you know a big part of the way that we're building our infrastructure is to really allow for adoption of the overall asset class. So for us, when we looked at it, there were custody issues, there were issues with platforms, and obviously issues with issuers themselves, um, not really understanding what Chinese walls need to li look like um, between origination and distribution and proper capital markets business. So to your question about regulators, um, I think Switzerland's probably the most advanced of the ones that you mentioned. Uh, the SFC um, have, have moved a lot faster in the last few months. I had a big announcement out at the end of October uh, where they you know, want to start to lay the ground for an overall architecture, much like we've seen with Abu Dhabi, um, having that very full architecture around combining traditional assets with uh, crypto assets. The other big problem is licensing. Um, so if you think about those regulators, you know, um, I think the only place where you could get a distribution license right now specifically for security tokens would be in uh, Switzerland with FINMA um, and uh, in ADGM with Abu Dhabi. There are ways to get around it in the US with the broker-dealer license. So we're actually in the process of getting a broker-dealer license in the US and looking at getting uh, type one and type six in Hong Kong as well uh, for down the road. Um, but I think it's really key that, that people like ourselves are work, excuse me, working with regulators to make sure that we get that sort of uh, buy-in early doors. Anybody else? No? Can I ask, on the topic of working with regulators, what approaches have you found to be successful in markets where you've engaged, and what approaches have you not tried that you think should be tried? Um, excellent question. Um, so we have, um, we're, we're in a privileged position where our chief compliance officer is the ex-global head of KYC at Thomson Reuters. 
So we had a 600-man compliance team. And, uh, you know, we've met with MAS, SFC, ADGM, JSFC, JFSA. And you can see visibly with his presence and just speaking very much like a regulator likes to be spoken to, they just breathe a visible sigh of relief that they're not dealing with another crypto company. Um, so I think really it's about making sure that people within the company have that DNA of regulatory compliance. You know, uh, you know at Diginex, we've obviously got people from both the crypto world and from the traditional finance world. And, you know, in early meetings, we, we would be sat there with, with some of the crypto guys saying, oh, let's do this, let's do that. And you've got the bankers just going, no, just no way, you can't do that. And so having that, that deep DNA is something that really does come across uh, often in, in regulator meetings. We had it in Jersey where, where you know, they've obviously had a, a very large exchange turn up in Jersey recently. But that that process was a, was a painful process for them. So I think, uh, you know, they said to us, they said, finally, it's just a relief to talk to someone that understands regulatory compliance. So I think it's just having the balance of, of both worlds in the DNA of the company. I think that's important. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.